It's great to be joined today by Stephanie Kelton, who's a professor of public policy and economics at Stony Brook University. She also served as chief economist on the U.S. Senate Budget Committee in 2015 and was an economic advisor to the Bernie Sanders 2016 presidential campaign. It's so great to talk to you. We are going to talk about modern monetary theory. Once again, of course, our audience knows that we recently uh, spoke to Pavlina Cherneva about this. We are now really getting to the end of uh, this potentially significant change to the American tax code. And one of the discussions that we had a little bit with Pavlina, and, I, and I'd love to expand on with you, is the discussion of the impact on the deficit of this plan. Stated plainly, should that be a consideration when we think about tax priorities? Well, only to the extent that politically adding to the deficit um, charges the debate and and you know, there are things that um, adding to the deficit could do, like, for example, um, lead to Republicans saying that they've got to make cuts to Medicare or something. Now, these are political considerations, not economic considerations. So uh, with that caveat in mind, I would say uh, that for the most part, the discussions and the objections Democrats are raising to the Trump tax cuts uh, on the grounds that they add to the deficit is really um, quite beside the point. Yeah. And, and in fact, a lot of the discussion around debt and deficit seems to be the pointing out of the hip the hypocrisy of when that is invoked in some sense. I mean, we know that we have some Republican senators who have previously vowed never to vote for any tax plan that increases the deficit by a penny. Bob Corker comes to mind. I think Rand Paul has made similar comments about the deficit. And yet now they seem not to care about that. Democrats, on the other hand, often don't talk about the debt or deficit when they're talking about programs. But now that it's Republicans who want to do it, are talking about it. It's sort of a punching bag political issue in a sense, isn't it? Definitely. I mean, it's definitely a political football. You're absolutely right. Both sides um, use this as an expedient way to try to score a quick point against the other team when they're raising objections to whatever agenda it is they're trying to push. Oh, but this is terrible because it's going to add to the deficit as if this is something that really resonates with voters that, you know, when you raise concerns about the national debt or deficits, that this is the best, uh, most effective way to get voters riled up and behind you uh, as you oppose a piece of legislation. I really think it's terribly misguided. Voters, for the most part, don't have the slightest idea, A, what the national debt is, what the deficit is, uh, and they really don't care what number ends up showing up on some government ledger somewhere as long as they're doing okay in their lives. So if the government is doing something that adds to the deficit, but in the end, people feel better off about their own job security. Maybe they see their wages going up. They feel like they're living in a better economy. They really don't care that the government is added to the deficit. It's more about you know what what is happening in voters' own lived experiences in the economy. That's the kind of thing that that matters, right? And if you tell people you're going to lose your health care, you're going to that stuff matters. You can get voters, and that's why I think you know when uh, Republicans were trying to do the repeal and replace, the opposition was so strong, right? Because um, you know the the Congressional Budget Office looked at this. And when they looked at what Republicans wanted to do, actually, it would have, quote, improved the deficit. Deficits would have been smaller as a result of the Republicans throwing millions of people off health care. But the Democrats didn't say, oh, they're doing this and it's going to shrink the size of the deficit. They said they're doing this and it's going to throw millions of people off their health care. And people stood up and said, over my dead body, we're not doing this. Right. And that put enough political pressure on Republicans. And in the end, they were unable to do this. So. Um, it's not it's not about the deficit that I think is not the way to the hearts and minds of the American people. One of the reactions that a lot of our audience had after we talked a little bit about this with Pavlina Cherneva was the inflationary aspect. And to take to take uh, ideally the, the most top level view of this, even for the economic sort of layperson, I think a lot of us could understand why. If you just start printing money, if you put more dollars in circulation or whatever term you want to use for this and you have holding you're holding steady the sort of economic output of a country, if you have more of these dollars, each dollar would be worth less or to put it a different way, prices might go up. There would be inflation to account for the fact that each dollar might be worth less. 
What's the simplest way to explain to someone who is again not not uh, who's an economic layperson why that would not happen if we were to say uh, create a job guarantee, universal basic income, pay for universal health care, whatever program we might imagine? Well, I think that it depends uh, a lot on what the program is. Uh, some of the things that you mentioned, I think we can uh, we can do without resulting in the kind of inflation problem that you're describing as a possibility. Other programs, I'm not so sure. Hmm. It depends on the type of program. You mentioned the universal basic income. One of the things that proponents of the UBI often do is say, well, everybody should get a living wage, the equivalent of a living wage. And sometimes they'll throw around a number like $30,000 a year. Just send everybody a check for $30,000 a year so they have a basic income to get by on. Well, if you actually run the numbers, that turns out to be a humongous increase in total spending. So if you're gonna add 30 or 40% of GDP to the economy, and not do something to offset that, then I think you're gonna get a pretty major inflation problem. So it does depend on the kind of program. What you're describing is a problem that arises when, as Milton Friedman, sort of, you know, the Chicago School of Economics, when Friedman described inflation as um, always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, he said it's too much money chasing too few goods. Okay, if you're doing something in the economy, whether it's a job guarantee program, large scale infrastructure program, making public colleges and universities tuition free, whatever it is that you're doing, if you're running up against the real constraints in the economy where you don't have the people and the factories and the machines, the capacity, the raw materials for government to take a larger share of what the economy has available and to spend into that economy, if those things aren't available, you're gonna end up bidding up prices. But if you're talking about doing things in a very deliberate way where you're mindful of how many raw materials do we have? Do we have the people? Do we have the capacity? How much additional infrastructure spending could we do in America without creating bottlenecks in, in the production process, without causing uh, an inflation problem? You always have to be aware of those kinds of considerations. So after uh, we started talking about MMT, I had a lot of people who emailed me and said, David, uh, you need to ask Stephanie Kelton about cryptocurrency, Bitcoin and others, because the explanation for why uh, MMT would work is or can be applied to why allegations that Bitcoin or whatever cryptocurrency have no intrinsic value are debunkable. Do you have a strong sense of that? How does MMT and the sort of underlying theory behind it connect to the uh, existence or lack of intrinsic value or inherent value in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies? Yeah, because, well, from our perspective, MMT likes to look at the currency and say, why does this otherwise worthless piece of paper, why does it have value? Why are people willing to give up a portion of their day working and producing in order to get this otherwise worthless thing called a US dollar, right? It's just an intrinsically worthless piece of paper, except that it's not worthless, right? And, and so the question becomes, why does the US dollar have value? Why are people willing to work and produce in order to get this thing? And MMT has always connected the value of the currency to the fact that we, the people, need the government's money in order to settle obligations to the government, in order to pay taxes and other fees and things to government. So ultimately, the US dollar is backed by taxes. It's backed by the government's ability to make us um, write contracts and produce and pay taxes in this currency called the US dollar. Bitcoin doesn't have that. It doesn't have anybody standing behind it, enforcing rules and laws and um, requiring people to make payments with this form of currency. So it's purely voluntary in that respect, right? And yeah, so I mean, I think to, to play devil's yeah. advocate, there would be the counter argument that while you don't have a government behind it, you do have the infrastructure of the blockchain. You've sort of decentralized the authority behind it. And that in a sense, again, I'm playing devil's advocate here, the defenders would say that's more valuable because you don't have any single entity in control of it. Yeah, it's more valuable to people who want that sort of anonymity. Mm. And so, you know, in the early stages, I think a lot of people were 
uh, very aware that you know a lot of the activity that was going on using Bitcoin was the kind of activity that people don't want the government or anybody else to be aware of because it's not legal. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I put I mean, on that, I would want to see some data only because I, I've, I've researched that aspect a little bit. I mean, I think er, earlier on in Bitcoin, when uh, the Silk Road was shut down, which was this kind of like dark web hub for the sale of everything from, you, you know, uh, assassination contracts and more commonly drugs. There was a very there was a very small change in the amount of Bitcoin being transacted. And that sort of implied that maybe the the illegal uses for it were not as big as was being mentioned. But in any case, it's not really our primary conversation here, but point taken. Yeah, I mean, the, the bottom line is that there isn't that anchor with respect to Bitcoin hmm. that there is with respect to a currency like the U.S. dollar or the British pound or the, the yen or a national currency. It just lacks that that government backing that maintains the value of the currency. So the value of the US dollar is never gonna to go to zero as long as you have a government that's able to make and enforce tax laws. The value of Bitcoin could theoretically go to zero. There's nothing to prevent that from happening. Um, would, would your feelings about its viability change if it was more widely accepted, not necessarily by governments, but by all by, by people, in other words, if the number of people in the market cap of it continued to increase and it did start to be accepted as a form of payment, would that change your mind on it? Or is it based on the fundamentals of its structure that you're that you're feeling well, this way? I don't know that I have my mind made up on it yeah. in some respects. So uh, I think it's a fascinating thing that we're all getting to watch, you know, what's happening with these cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, Bitcoin in particular. Um, and to the extent that it actually begins to function in the ways that early on, you know, people said it was going to be an important means of exchange. We're not really seeing that. But I think if we do begin to see that happening, um, it's going to be fascinating to watch. And, yeah, I can I can definitely uh, change my perspective of the usefulness of this uh, cryptocurrency and others like it as we watch this experiment unfold. I just don't have really strong opinions on it one way or another yet. To circle back more specifically to at least the U.S. government and its relationship to debt deficit and the ideas of modern monetary theory, is there any particular policy sort of to round out our conversation that you think that if we could get wholesale sort of buy in and understanding of the principles of MMT, there was one policy that it would point to our legislators enacting that would most benefit society? Is there something you have in mind? I think. Probably the the one that I would go to is the federal job guarantee. I mean, this is the this is the kind of cornerstone policy in a sense with uh, the MMT school of thought. The basic idea here is that there's no other uh, economic school of thought that um, has a solution for the problem of involuntary unemployment. Not a single one. And so the best that you can do in any of the mainstream approaches to economics is to say to the central bank, um, you know, target the unemployment rate, keep the level of unemployment at just the right level so that we prevent inflation from accelerating above 2% per year. In other words, we're relying on policymakers to maintain a certain amount of unemployment in the system as a guard against inflation. And what MMT does is say that's extraordinarily inefficient. It's very wasteful. There are costs borne, not just you know in terms of lost output, uh, but a variety of social costs as well, that the economy would function better, that we would have a more prosperous economy if we institutionalized full employment. And the way to do that is through a federally funded but locally administered jobs program. And it would just make the overall economy function better because what it does is it takes the automatic stabilizers, the features that are already there today to help cushion the economy as it goes through the inevitable you know, booms and busts of a business cycle. And it turbocharges the automatic stabilizer, makes them stronger so that when we have a downturn, the unemployment rate recovers more quickly. Uh, it's not as lasting. It's not as deep. Look at what happened in the Great Recession, right? It took nine years to claw back all the jobs that were lost. So I think that's probably, if I have to pick one, that's the policy that I'm uh, most enthusiastic about. We've been speaking with Stephanie Kelton, professor of public policy and economics at Stony Brook University. I really appreciate you talking to me today. You're, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me.